While 1987's momentary lapse of reason might have left something to be desired, Pink Floyd's 1994 album, The Division Bell, was a return to form. And in my opinion, it's one of their best albums. Seriously, I think it can stand with Dark Side of the Moon or Wish You Were Here. The Division Bell was the first new Pink Floyd release I have vivid memories of, specifically seeing that iconic cover in my father's CD collection. It was once again designed by Storm Thurgeson, channeling the album's concept of communication, and it may actually be one of my favorite album covers. As a kid, I used to see the designs as one single face, now I can only see two separate faces looking at each other. That in and of itself might reflect how our perception of the world changes as we get older. In the distance is the Eli Cathedral in Cambridge, a nod to the album's final track where its namesake comes from. One of the reasons this album is such a milestone ahead of Momentary Lapse of Reason is the triumphant return of Richard Wright. If you've been watching my series thus far, you know Rick was of course a driving force behind the classic era of Pink Floyd, but by the wall, his contributions had diminished and he was... asked to leave by Roger Waters. And even when Roger left, there was an issue giving Rick full member status again. I believe he was even thinking of leaving the group because of this. I, mean, I have nothing to say. But by the time the division bell came around, he was a full band member again. On this one, I've been involved right from the beginning, and writing and singing, and it's a completely different situation this time, and I'm not on a wage. David Gilmore is still the driving force here, but even he seems much more confident in his writing and playing abilities. Likewise, Nick Mason is playing drums on pretty much all the songs. And his feel makes a big difference, especially with touring bassist Guy Pratt appearing on a good chunk of the album. Also, John Karen is back on keyboards. Tim Renwick plays some guitar parts. Gary Wallace plays percussion. Durga McBroom and Sam Brown return to sing, and Bob Ezrin is back in the producer's chair with engineer Andy Jackson. Even Dick Perry would return on saxophone, as well as Michael Kamen with his beautiful orchestrations. But unlike Momentary Lapse of Reason, the album sessions started with the core three band members convening at Britannia Row, where animals have been recorded, and did what they used to do, jam to see whether we could actually sort of invent anything as a band rather than uh, entirely electronically. With Bob Ezrin standing in on bass and Guy Pratt stepping in later, the band had apparently amassed 65 pieces of music similar to the nothings they had created for metal. We didn't use, in the end, that much of what we got to at that point. And but it got us moving. They discussed putting together a second disc of instrumental material, then called The Big Spliff. We'll talk more about that later. So apparently they referred to these pieces as clusters, hence the title of the first song, Cluster One, which starts off in classic Pink Floyd style with electromagnetic noise. I remember my dad telling me when he first heard this, he thought his CD player was broken, which in and of itself kind of introduces the theme of miscommunication. But it's really when we get those first three notes on Rick's piano, echoed by Dave's guitar, that the magic really begins. Their majestic chemistry harkens back to the classic sound of echoes or shine on you crazy diamond, and Nick chimes in later with a soft kick and cymbal. I can tell you, this album is already better than Momentary Lapse of Reason. It's like, oh my god, Pink Floyd is a band again. And it really helps that it sounds more organic, and that they're not relying on contemporary synthesizers as much to overwhelm the sound. Early 90s rock definitely had enjoyed a stripped-back return to form, and it helped that Pink Floyd actually employed their old keyboard gear to get some more organic sounds, with John Karen programming them into the modern technology. It really is the perfect way to begin this album, feeling like a fly on the studio wall with Dave, Rick, and Nick just jamming away. And it really is, in classic Pink Floyd fashion, the spaces between the notes that creates the ambience. And then in a seamless transition, we get our first proper rocker, What Do You Want From Me? co-written musically by Dave and Rick. Yeah, this song kicks ass with Rick back on roads with that wah pedal, those unmistakable Nick Mason drum fills supported by Guy Pratt's bass, and David comes in screaming on guitar. <laughs> It 
just sounds so good. Those bluesy licks with his signature bends and whammy bar, augmented with just enough effects for a classic Pink Floyd guitar sound. I didn't realize until I started working on the series how much this song sounds like the instrumental Raise My Rent from Dave's first solo album. But it's still its own thing with David's vocal in fine form, answered by those gospel vocals led by Durga McBroom and Sam Brown. Also, I love the sound of this track. And I think we got some, one of the best drum sounds we've ever had, and that came from a little room on his boat. Sonically, it is arguably the best Pink Floyd has ever sounded. It may still have a little bit of those leftover 80s textures at times, but they're used sparingly. My favorite part of the song, which I'm pretty sure is Rick's handiwork, is the bridge which modulates from an E minor to C sharp minor with Dave and Rick singing harmonies. Oh my god, their voices sound so good together. Lyrically, there's been a lot of speculation as to what these lyrics are all about. Is Dave singing about Roger? Is that why he writes, sing until I can't sing anymore, play these strings till my fingers are raw? Well, Dave has said he's open to interpretation with these songs, but also admits that it's really about a relationship and the miscommunication thereof. Which I guess brings us to the co-writer of these lyrics, Polly Sampson. Oh my god, would you all stop already? Seriously. Polly Sampson, a journalist, David's girlfriend at the time and current wife, would co-write most of the lyrics on the Division Bell and David's solo records. I went off uh, to try and start writing lyrics and my girlfriend Polly came with me. Playing me the tracks and saying, I don't know what to do, what, 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 what should the lyric be? As these things do work, she got more and more involved and I would say, listen to this, what do you think of this? And she'd say, well that's crap, uh, or that's good, and would come up with ideas. Gradually, I had to face up to the fact that she was properly contributing. To this day, she remains a divisive figure among Floyd fans. Even Roger Waters took shots at her, and the less said about their exchanges, the better. But even among the Pink Floyd camp at the time, there were some reservations about the boys club being invaded. However, they also admit that she really did help bring David's ideas to life. Because the lyrics have been so heavily scrutinized on this album, especially the No Roger, No Floyd crowd, I thought it might be best to get a neutral opinion and bring back Todd Meredith, who reviewed Animals with me, to get his opinion on the lyrics. So I'll let you take it from here, Todd. Hey, JT. So I should disclose that I'm actually not a huge fan of the Vision Bell. These records that are super lengthy like this and are kind of lacking as far as really rock and upbeat songs, they're just not my cup of tea. But that doesn't mean that this album is devoid of musical genius or great lyrics for that matter. The lyrics are very conversational. David Gilmer often posing questions, a lot of lyrics come off like a journal entry, which might be explained by Polly Sampson's influence considering her journalism background. One song in particular I like is A Great Day for Freedom. Now frontiers shift like desert sands while nations wash their bloodied hands of loyalty, of history, in shades of gray. Now that's really cool. That's some poetry right there. Now Roger, on the other hand, he loves to paint you a picture. Like he will talk about a monkey on a rock and give you exactly what he's listening to, what he's holding in his hand, what he ate for breakfast. It goes on and on for two or three verses. And while I really enjoy the lyrics on some of Roger's songs, like the bravery of being out of range, where he gets real sarcastic and clever, I don't need David Gilmore to recreate that same thing. And I think it's pretty cool that Gilmore doesn't feel the need to be as wordy and verbose as Waters. I think he does more of his talking with the guitar. Anybody who really wants something different, I think was just more gravitating more to Waters' style and was missing the fact that Roger Waters isn't in the band anymore. Pulls Apart is probably my favorite song on the album. I assume it's about his friend and former bandmate Sid Barrett. It's very relatable nonetheless, even if you haven't had a friend who's gone completely insane. You might have had a friend who you've grown apart from, or they've changed a little bit, and you've kind of gone your separate ways, and you have some regrets about that. So I think that's a very relatable song with a beautiful, beautiful acoustic guitar riff. <laughs> Speaking
Speaking of Pulls Apart, Todd is correct when he said it's about Sid Barrett, at least partially. It was one of the first lyrics David started working on with Nick Laird Close of Dream Academy. But rather than just writing some lyrics to go to Dave's music, Nick was more interested in helping Dave find his own meaning in the song, eventually asking him to talk about Sid Barrett, to which David replied, I never thought he'd lose that light in his eyes, hearkening back to Shine On You Crazy Diamond. Polly was asked to chime in with ideas, and finally, a song with finished words was completed. And with so many fans speculating as to whether these songs are about Roger Waters, this is the only song that she's confirmed is about him, specifically the second verse that begins with Hey You. The shimmering acoustics are a nice contrast to the heavier blues sound of the previous song, and is dressed up with a tasteful organ solo by Rick. Speaking of which, the next song, Marooned, is another ambient keyboard instrumental and one of the best Pink Floyd ever came up with. It's another song that emerged from their jams. That chord sequence is so quintessentially Rick, almost sounding like us and them. And it really does evoke this feeling of being marooned on an island somewhere, or maybe something even a little more cerebral, like being marooned in your own mind or being so introverted that you feel like you're marooned from other people. David improvises over the changes with a whammy pedal weaving between octaves. And I started playing with this thing. Rick started playing on a keyboard and suddenly it sounded a bit like whales. We called it the whale piece for ages. Just the sound of his guitar conjures images of waves and wind against the shore. It's another David Gilmore solo that can stand with the best like Comfortably Numb and would actually win Pink Floyd a Grammy for Best Instrumental. Returning to a lyrical song, Great Day for Freedom discusses the fall of the Berlin Wall, although once again, some Floyd fans insist it's about Roger's wall, which Dave has denied. I agree with Todd in the lyrics here, and will say this is probably the closest the later Pink Floyd writing ever came to matching Roger Waters' lyrical style on the wall or the final cut. I think there are quite a few layers being discussed here, both with the Berlin Wall and any kind of change globally or personally. If we're carrying on with the theme of communication, I think the lesson here is can we actually learn from the division of the past and grow, or are we just going to not speak of it, sweep it under the rug, and make the same mistakes again? It's one reason why I'll defend Polly's contributions to this album. Also, at the end, we get another gorgeous guitar solo from David Gilmore. It's like every single solo on this record is top tier. But then we really shift gears to wearing the inside out with the return of Dick Perry sax, which just hits the same nerve it did on Dark Side or Wish You Were Here. In Guy Pratt's Lockdown Licks videos, he reveals that this was a rare time a Floyd song emerged from one of his own ideas. I wanted to, rather than just coming up with a bass line or something, I was thinking there's so many sort of great Pink Floyd things which are about using the bass in an unconventional way. And I came up with this idea of, by using a delay, creating a bass pad and then playing chords over the top, then doing it as one piece. And finally, after 20 years of not taking a lead vocal, Rick steps up to the mic and sings his lone musical composition. From morning to night. I'm not going to act like Rick's voice is as rich as it was on earlier records, but the melancholy is still there and perfectly suited for the song. I basically hadn't really sung for 20 years and did one take and Bob Ezen said, okay, that's it, which I couldn't believe. The lyrics were written by Anthony Moore from the last album, and if you've ever dealt with feelings of depression, anxiety, and the inability to communicate about said issues, wearing the inside out hits pretty damn hard. It's especially relevant when you know Rick's history with the band and his own depression. No one can sing the song but him. Now, if I can bring up a nitpick, I would agree with Todd that the album's been a little bit on the slow side thus far, which isn't uncommon with Pink Floyd records, but now is a good time to bring the energy up. And fortunately, these next three songs, which could be a sweet in and of themselves, I'd put up there with Wish You Were Here. Take It Back samples David Gilmore using an ebo on an acoustic guitar before we get a groove set by a delay-driven guitar reminiscent of Run Like Hell. 
Yes, I'm aware people say this sounds like U2, but again, U2 got the sound from Pink Floyd. This song might be closest in spirit to the previous hit single, Learning to Fly, probably why it was chosen as a single for this album. Bob Ezrin co-wrote the song with Dave, Polly, and Nick Laird Close. The lyrics on this one are pretty obvious, our abusive relationship with Mother Nature and how she will take it back someday. And these days, given how we're already feeling the effects of climate change, this seems very real. But musically, it's one of the more optimistic sounding songs. David's voice just soars here. The way he hits those high G's is euphoric. It also includes one of my favorite ambient breaks on the album, featuring a child's voice singing Ring Around the Rosy. Is this a commentary on our children's future? We all fall down being a tie-in? And this segues perfectly into, honestly, my favorite song on the album, Coming Back to Life, the only song solely written by David Gilmour. It starts off similar to Shine On You Crazy Diamond with a soft guitar solo over synth pads. But then Dave's voice takes over. Where you? And it just really tugs at your heartstrings. I know Dave actually wrote the song about falling in love with Polly and coming out of his hedonistic lifestyle, but for the past few years, the song has taken a deeper meaning for me personally. I lost my father to ALS in 2018, the very man who turned me on to this music, and this album in particular. And when I would walk around in the darkest depths of grief and despair, I played this song and it really did bring me back to life. And when the drums come in, it really feels like a release. It doesn't even matter what the song is about at that moment. And David's guitar continues to build the dynamics, especially when he hits those rhythmic stabs supported by Rick's organ. Listening to the song again brought real tears to my eyes. I guess it's honestly why I feel so protective of this album and don't like hearing people write it off just because Roger's not involved. And the momentum keeps going, that Ebo sample returns, only this time against the more sinister backdrop of Keep Talking, written by Dave and Rick with Polly's lyrics. They even sample a passage from Stephen Hawking, and... You know, I think I need to convey another personal affiliation, knowing the ALS connection between Dr. Hawking and my father. And to be honest, I think this song is what inspired me to sample my father's poetry for my Elements piece. I swear there is sound here. Dr. Hawking's words are nonetheless inspiring, echoing the very theme of this album. It doesn't have to be like this. All we need to do is make sure we keep talking. This is probably the most 90s sounding track of all of them, featuring drum machines and sequencers, but it does add to the song's atmosphere, especially with Dr. Hawking's voice. Of course, his guitar does plenty of talking in the song, also Rick's mini Moog takes a solo, all supported by Nick's heavy groove and Guy's bass. Dave even busts out his talk box at the end. These three songs are thankfully grouped together on my vinyl copy, and it's the side I play most often. If you need a reason to listen to the Post Waters Floyd, I would say these three songs are it. They work together thematically, musically, and emotionally. And that brings us to the home stretch. To be honest, Lost for Words might be my least favorite part of the album, coming off as such a provocative run of songs, and this is one instance where it's pretty clear this is about Roger Waters. I'd be very shocked if it wasn't. But funny enough, Todd found deeper meaning in these lyrics. Lost for Words is my other favorite. It's another song that holds up great just on an acoustic guitar, and it's got a great message. It's basically like, okay, I tried my best. I know that this is not gonna work out, this relationship with this guy. He's still going to tell me to go F myself, but I can't win, but I'm still going to let it go and just move on. But the album's swan song is a highlight among the entire Pink Floyd catalog, High Hopes. And this harkens back to one of David's earliest themes on songs like Fat Old Son, his youth in Cambridge. It's very Penny Lane-ish in that there's several nods to real places like The Long Road, The Cut, but the album's namesake seems to be more elusive. 
I used to think it referred to the bells at Eli Cathedral from the album cover, which I believe are sampled at the beginning of the song, but the division bell is actually used in Parliament. And it is a bell that rings to summon all the members of Parliament to go to the Houses of Commons and to divide into yeas and nays to vote on the issues. Lyrically, I think it's most parallel to something like Robert Frost's The Road Not Taken. Feelings of nostalgia, regret, disappointment, trying to get a glimpse of how green it was on the other side. And there really does seem to be a nod to the lost idealism of Sid Barrett. You can even hear this in the final two lines, the endless river forever and ever, very similar to those heard on C. Emily Play. You have to understand that for a long time, this was the final Pink Floyd song. So in quoting Sid, it all comes full circle. I think that's why a lot of fans felt this was an appropriate finale for the band, especially when that ethereal lap steel comes in. I know I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but this is another one of David Gilmour's best solos, especially when it's echoed by Michael Kamen's orchestra. It's a true climax, fading out with the ringing of the division bell. But it wouldn't be a Pink Floyd album without one more little Easter egg. Manager Steve O'Rourke had always wanted to be on a Pink Floyd album, and they acquiesced to this request by featuring a lo-fi recording of him talking to Charlie, Polly's son, on the phone and him hanging up. Is that Charlie? Communication breakdown remains at large. So with the album finished, what was it to be called? Names like Down to Earth and Pow Wow were discussed, but author Douglas Adams, of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fame, suggested the title The Division Bell, looking at these lyrics, in exchange for a donation to the Environmental Investigation Agency. I think Douglas Adams definitely deserved a round of pan-galactic gargablasters for that suggestion. So yeah, the Division Bell was the Pink Floyd album that fans have been waiting for, and it still stands up with their 70s output. The music is sublime. David Gilmour's voice and guitar are as great as they've ever been. And again, it really shows how instrumental Rick Wright is to their sound. Even Nick's steady beat, and Guy Pratt has become an integral part of their sound as well. Say what you will about Polly Sampson, but her lyrical contributions are a welcome addition here. But what did Roger Waters think? Had time healed wounds, and did he open up to this album's return to form? And thematic, yeah, you already know the answer to that. He called it an awful record, seems to hate it even more than Momentary Lapse of Reason, but even the critics seemed pretty hard on it. Some of the critics have said that this album is almost like Pink Floyd getting back and recreating their past a little bit, which is obviously really successful. Do you, do you think that's right? It's a criticism. I, I think it may be a good criticism. There was no attempt to make it sound like anything we'd done before, but I mean, we sound like we sound, so if we're all contributing and playing together, then it does tend to sound a bit like Pink Floyd. It didn't matter because this album went platinum and seems to be the most well-received of the Gilmore trilogy, for myself included. The Division Bell gets a goldfish for me. And honestly, I was hesitant to buy it on record considering it really came out during the CD age, but it sounds really good on vinyl. As I said before, Coming Back to Life is the song that hits me the hardest on an emotional level, but that whole section of Take It Back, Coming Back to Life, and Keep Talking is a must-listen. As is What Do You Want From Me, Marooned, and the climactic High Hopes. But this is an album you can listen to the whole way through. And like I said, this would have been a fine way to conclude Pink Floyd's discography, but we'll discuss that another time. Before we do, let's talk about the subsequent tour, so I'll see you all next time, and special thanks to Todd Meredith for joining me on this one. Yeah.